welcome to today's in-home clinic. Um, I'm really excited to be able to share with you guys. Um, I hope that someone takes just something out of it that will help their in-home. Um, so this is the Coast to Coast, the Sky Point in-home clinic that we're having every Thursday. The nice thing about Family First Life is that we have so many talented people and there's so many trainings available that you can get. My in-home is literally just me watching other people and taking things that I can relate to and things that I can see myself saying um, and creating my own. So before I get started, I just want you guys just to real quick, just to understand the business that we're in. So the clients that we're sitting with are honestly one to maybe 2% of people in the United States. There are people who fill things out. There are people that have either mailed something in, filled out a form online, filled out a lead on Facebook, but they basically have raised their hand asking for help. So I, so the most important thing that I tell new agents to understand is we're not calling cold calling people and trying to convince them to buy life insurance. We're calling people who have already said, Hey, I want help. I just need someone to come see me that knows what they're doing that I can trust and to help me with something that I already know I want. So if you guys can understand that is we're not inconveniencing these people. We're almost like fulfilling a need that they've requested. So that's one thing, that's like a mind sh a mindset shift that's really important. Is so when I go in a house, I'm not worried I'm gonna say the wrong thing or I'm not worried I'm inconveniencing someone. Like I already know like, okay, they've requested the help for me. So I'm just there to help them. And if you're likable, you're, you're honest and people trust you, they're gonna wanna do business. It doesn't matter who shows up. So um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, is to really understand that 25% of people are going to say yes, regardless of who shows up. So if you're brand new, if you've been doing this for 10 years, if you've never done sales before, 25% of people are going to have a void of check stable to their face, ready to buy insurance. And they'll have 10 policies in place already, but they just love life insurance. They want another policy. The other 25% of people are going to say no. It could be the best salesperson out there, the best insurance agent out there. And they're going to say no to anyone who shows up. They are just maybe lonely. They want somebody to come over just to spend time with them. They just uh, they just want to see what's out there, but they have no intention to buy. And then the 50% of people, that's where your skill comes up. So right now, if you're a new agent, what you lack in skill, you're going to make, an act, make up an activity. So you're going to just run a ton of appointments and sit with a ton of people so your skill gets built. And then eventually, instead of closing, you know, 10% of people, you'll start closing 20% of people, 30% of people. So um, I just wanted to touch on that real quick, just like, just so you guys know the people we're sitting with. And then the second thing is, is just how to prepare for your in-homes. So your mindset is the most important thing in this business. Um, I tell everyone before I go into a house, I do this virtually in um, in home. So I'm a hybrid model. So I help clients over the phone, over Zoom, and I actually still go to see my clients at their houses. Um, so regardless of what type of appointments you're running, you need to get your mindset right before running them. So people do different things to get prepared for that. I personally um, listen to Christian music before I go into um, before I go into my clients' houses. I don't that just gets me ready. But people listen to podcasts, listen to trainings, listen to different things that are going to prepare you to have your mind right. So when you see your clients, the second thing is you need to envision yourself helping people. So I know that sounds silly, but before I go into a house, I am envisioning myself saying, hey, this person wants my help. This person's requesting my help. So I'm going to go ahead and do what I can do to help them. So I'm, you know, I'm gonna challenge them. I'm gonna be uncomfortable. I'm gonna ask them questions that make me uncomfortable, but it's just because I'm coming from a place of caring. I'm not worried about my commission that I'm gonna receive. I'm worried that if they don't come home tomorrow, that I put, some, I did everything I could to make sure that their family's protected. And that's the way I see my clients is that today is the last day they're gonna be here. So I need to do everything in my power to make sure that they're protected. So if something happens tomorrow, their family's okay. So, um, okay. So 
let me go ahead and jump in straight to what I do. So I'm going to do an in-home scenario. So when I go into my client's houses, uh, the first thing I do, obviously, you walk in, um, you want to be, you knock on the door, and I'm very much to the point. I don't do a ton of rapport building in the beginning. I do it as I'm helping my client, as I'm doing the application. So in the beginning, I'm literally like, hey, Bob, Mary, do you have a table we can sit at? And as I'm walking through the house, I will, or the apartment or whatever it is, I pick up on things that I genuinely think are nice. So if they have a picture of their family, oh, you guys have a huge, you guys have a nice family. If they have an animal, oh, that's a nice dog. How long have you had the dog? That type of thing. Just to find something I can genuinely relate to them with right away. So that way, when I'm talking to them during the application, I have something to ask about. So um, I direct them to the table. Okay, perfect. I need I need a table to sit at because I'm going to have to write, have, write a couple of things down. Um, once we get to the table, I honestly pull out two sheets. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quick. So the first one I pull out is going to be this credibility sheet. Um, there's new ones out. I am just haven't updated mine. I'm, I'm a creature of habit. This works for me. So I've been using the same one. So I just, I pull this out and then I <clears throat> pull out my financial inventory. My financial inventory is like one of the first financial inventories that I think were made. And there's so many better ones out there, but this is the one that I use. And the reason why I use it is just because I get comfortable and I'm comfortable with this financial inventory. Um, so I pull both of the credibility and the financial inventory sheet out. And my first question is just to explain who I am and what I'm doing, what I'm here to do. So I just go, Bob, Mary, uh, my name's Elaine. I'm a field, I'm a local field underwriter that they assigned to get the information you requested to you, um, out to you. So my job's simple. I try to find something that's affordable, that's gonna fit in your budget, because I know that's the most important thing. And something that if you passed away tomorrow, you know your family's protected, okay? And so I tell them, so I'm what you call an insurance broker. I represent a ton of different insurance carriers, but I don't work for one insurance carrier specifically. So what that means is I can do the shopping with you and I'm on your side, Bob and Mary. I tell everyone, I my job is to put something in place for you. I, that's gonna make sense for the two of you, not for the insurance carrier. Does that make sense? So I just let them know that I'm working with them. I work for them. I don't work for the insurance carrier. I work with them and I work for them to find the best option for them. Because at the end of the day, your clients are not gonna remember what insurance carrier they got the life insurance with. They're gonna remember that Travis came and helped them. They're gonna remember, I have a Travis policy. Like that's all, like, I don't know what carrier I have. It comes out of my bank every month, but Travis was the guy that came and helped me. So I'm selling myself to people. So I'm telling them, hey, Bob, Mary, I work with you to find the best option for you. It doesn't matter. I'm not biased to any insurance carrier. I want to find what's best for you. Um, so once I explain that to them, I just go, this is what the process is going to look like. Okay, Bob, we're just going to spend a couple, I'm going to spend a couple minutes going over finance questions. I'm going to go spend a couple minutes going over your health. And Bob, it's not to be nosy or to get in your business, but it's just so I can help you the best that I can. Because what I've realized is that sometimes you, um, you may not need this at all, and I'll be the first to tell you, or sometimes you don't need as much coverage as you think that you need. But I just want to make sure I have all of the information I can to help you the best that I can. Does that make sense? And then they say yes. And I'm doing soft close is throughout the whole appointment. Does that make sense, Bob? Does that make sense, Mary? And they're just like, yes, yes. Because then when you're getting to information like the social security, they're so used to saying yes to you already, it's easier for them to say yes. So then once I, uh, <clears throat> I explain that, I go, and then Bob, Mary, after I'm done showing you your options, we're going to do one of two things, okay? We're either going to, one, you guys are either going to say, hey, Elaine, we're good. We don't want this coverage. That's perfectly fine. You'll go ahead and sign this. That just, show, um, that just shows I came out and showed you your options. We'll close out your file. You'll no longer be contacted. 
Okay. So that alleviates the, Hey, she's trying to sell me something. This is like, I just basically just took that, took away that objection. I'm not selling you anything because if you tell me no, no big deal. So then the second, and then I go, or we're going to put an application into the insurance carrier to see if they qualify you. Okay. So in order for me to put that, um, that application in Bob, I'm going to need three things from you. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to need it's to see your driver's license to make sure it is you applying for the coverage. The second thing I'm gonna need is you'll verbally give me your social security number because all of your health information is tied to that. And then the last thing I'm gonna need is your bank account information, okay? For automatic um, um, premium payment withdrawals. And the border. Okay, um, let me meet this guy. And then I go, is that something that you're comfortable with giving me? And then they usually ask, well, I don't know. I just kind of wanted to see what was out there. And I go, no, I understand that. But once I show you your options and you want to, and we put an application in, those are the three things I'm going to need to do the application. Is that, something, is that something that you're comfortable with giving to me when I need that? And I get a yes 99.9% .9 of the time. And they go, yes. And so now when I go back to the app, when we're in the application portion, I'm not wait, I'm not saying, hey, I need your I need your bank account. And it's like an awkward question. I told them in the beginning, this is what I'm gonna need. So if they tell me, well, I'm not comfortable with giving you your bank, my my bank account. Well, Bob, I told you in the beginning that in order for me to put the application in, I'm gonna need it. You said yes. So we need to put that in there. And that just allows you to just overcome objections ahead of time. Um, so as soon as I say that. Honestly, I just go straight into the financial inventory. So that's just my, on, that takes two, maybe three minutes of opening up. And I, like I said, I don't spend a ton of time of rapport. Um, I am really big at breaking down income when it comes to building, um, when I'm filling out my financial inventory. So I'm not like a budget person. I know there's different people that, you know, do the bills and things like that. I don't, I don't do that. I do, but especially if I'm sitting with a husband and wife and they're looking for like burial coverage or any type of life insurance, I'm really, really break down the income. So I just, if I, if I was sitting with a husband and wife, I'd say, Bob, Mary, Bob, um, I'll start with you, Bob. You know, what is your monthly income after taxes? Are you receiving social security? Are you receiving um, a pension? Are you still working? And then once I figure that out, and if they say, oh, well, we make this month, I'm like, okay, no, I need you guys to separate it so I could see what you're left with in the event of either of you dying. So then once I have them separate it, it's honestly just, okay, Bob makes $1,200 from Social Security, and then he has an $800 pension a month. So he's making 1800 bucks a month. And I go, okay, Bob, does your pension have survivorship? And I go, so if you pass away tomorrow, does Mary get a portion of your pension? Does she get the full pension? Does it, does it end with you? And majority of the time, they always think that they, that it has for survivorship because I mean, they, they want to have the income stay, but I just tell, um, they go, so I go, we're always basing it on half because the majority of the time it is, if it is any type of survivorship, it's about 50%. And then I go, Mary, what is your income? Are you on social security? Do you receive a pension? Oh, I get $800 a month. Okay, perfect. So you receive $800 a month from social security. How long have the two of you been married? Oh, you guys have been married for 50 years? That's amazing. You never hear that anymore. I compliment them as I'm going on. Just they, people love that. And then I just go, are, you, are the two of you aware of how social security works? And then I explained to them how they will receive in the event of one of them passing, they'll receive the highest of the two. So I just, at that point I go, so Bob, if you passed away tomorrow, Mary's $800 is no longer there and she'll start receiving your 1200 and your pension. So to all together right now, you guys bring you guys a month. I got to do it on math. <laughs> I mean, on a calculator. Okay, so together between your three incomes between is 2,800 a month. Well, if Bob passes away tomorrow and his pension ends and his, and 
Mary's social security ends, now all she's living off of is Bob's social security, which is $1,200 a month. So I make sure I circle that. I circle and I say, Mary, this is what you're going to be left with a month if Bob doesn't come home tomorrow so that they understand that. And then I do the same thing for Mary. Okay, so now Mary, your social security is no longer here. So Bob's gonna end up with $2,000 a month, okay? So when I'm sitting with a situation like that, I if I tell them, especially because I, I realize, I'll, I'll look at the amount of income that's coming in. And then I look at the amount of income, like how much are they paying for their apartment? Or if they live on a in a house, how much are they paying for their rent? And if I figured, let's say that their rent is half of their their monthly income, I realize they probably have bills that are going to be pretty expensive. So when I or that is eating up a lot of their income every month. So what I do is I tell them. So Bob, in your guys' situation, if I was sitting with my grandma and grandpa, financially, if something happens, I mean, if something happens to Mary tomorrow, Bob financially, you could still afford to pay your bills. But if something happens to you, Bob, Mary can't afford to pay the bills anymore. She can't afford to live. So if we're going to do one or the other, what I would suggest doing is protecting you, Bob, so that if something happens to you, Mary is okay. And she's able to continue to live and pay her and pay the house or pay the, pay her bills. And so that's what I do. So I always, I, I don't break down the budget and to see how much money they're left with every month. But I do assume, like, I do get how much they pay for their mortgage or their apartment or their rent, whatever it is a month and see how much of that is eating their monthly income. Because I don't want to put them into something where if you're sitting with someone that's making $1,200 a month and they're, they, they rent a room for $400, and you're trying to show them a policy for $300, that's not going to make financial sense to them. So you really have to be aware of like where your clients are at financially and show them something that you know they're going to be comfortable with every day. Because life insurance, a lot of people, as much as we see it as a necessity, a lot of people don't think it is because they don't think that they're going to pass away tomorrow. So you have to, so when you're sitting with people, you obviously have to explain to them why it's so important, but you also got to understand and meet them where they're at. So in their mind, they don't see this as a necessity. So when I'm showing them options, I'm not trying to show them options for something that's going to cost them a crazy amount because it's not like, it's, it's like cable. They, it's not something that they need every month. They do, but they don't think they do. So when I'm showing them something, I want to show them something that they can afford and they're not going to be like, oh, I'll just cancel my life insurance and I'll get to it eventually. Because then now you're at a chargeback. So that's why I tell everyone, you just want to really understand and sit with your clients and see where they're at, find, see where they're at so you can put them in a position that they keep this long-term. Because at the end of the day, that's why we're doing this, right? To make sure clients are protected. Um, so once I do that, I show up. So I really just say, okay, Bob, if something happens to you, then Mary is going to be the one that can't afford everything. So let's protect you. Um, and then that's when I figure out why I'm there. And that's where I, that's where I ask the, this is where I ask the tough questions and I tell them and I go, Mary, if Bob didn't come home tomorrow, or if Bob didn't wake up in the morning, what would you do? what is, what does it look like for you? And I stay quiet. I don't let Bob answer. And this question is directed to Mary. And what you'll realize is about 99% of the time, people will say, I don't know. I never thought about it. And you just go, okay, I understand that. But now we're thinking about it. So what would you realistically, if something happens tomorrow, what would you do? And then there's just a wall. I don't know. I, I have to figure something out. And I'm just like, okay, so that's why I'm here because we don't want to, I know, I understand you don't want to think about that, but one day Bob is not going to be here and I'm here to put something in place so that when Bob, when that day comes, you're not worried what you're going to do about finances. You are, you, we have a life insurance policy in place that's going to help you 
get through a few months, or that's going to help pay for his burial, or that's going to help pay for the mortgage, whatever it is, we have something in place. So that way, when something happens to Bob, financially, you'll still be okay. And that's where I create the need. I create the why, and I create why this, like why they need this so much. And I spend maybe a minute doing it. I don't spend a ton of time trying to drag out stories or anything like that. And it's just so that that way they can see why this is important and that they can see why they need to, why Bob wants to protect his wife. And then if, if you're sitting with a, a husband and wife and they see their wife saying, well, I don't know what I would do. They're, they're automatically going to be like, oh, okay, I need to put something in place or whatever it is. Or if you're sitting with a, a just a mom that wants to protect her daughter, her kids, they're going to be like, well, yeah, you're right. I do need to put something in place. Um, so once I do that, I honestly, the next question I ask is, um, I jump right into what do you guys have that acts like life insurance? Or what do you guys have in place today that acts like life insurance? Or what do you have in place that today that if something happened to you, to Bob tomorrow, Mary, you could have access to that money. And I ask them, do you have any life insurance? Do you guys have any type of retirement accounts, like significant amount of savings, anything that will help? And majority of the time, people are going to say no, or yeah, I have some life insurance, but it's like a burial policy. It's like really little. Okay. How much is it? Um, probably like 5,000. Cause that's honestly what majority of people have. And I go, okay, perfect. So that's set up for cremation. So now we're just trying to put something in place. So that way, Mary, financially, you have some money if something happens. And then um, I'm a top-down seller. So if I did not know that that's what I did until I think I sat with, so I was talking to someone about my in-home and then that's what they called it. So I always show the max amount of coverage um, just because you don't know, you do sit with those people that are like, it may be expensive. Like if I saw the, you know, $400 a month for life insurance, for me, that might seem like a lot, but for someone else that you're sitting with, that might be something that's affordable and something that they want to pay to protect their loved ones. So I tell everyone I show max the max. I always lead with Eagle Premier. Um, especially if you guys are new, Eagle Premier, if you guys are in a home and you don't know um, what to write, and for some reason you can't get a hold of your upline, if you do the pre-check with Eagle Premier, it literally takes two minutes and you'll know if your client is going to, and then that way it gives you time to pivot or gives you time to reach someone to tell you exactly what to write. But um, I always leave with Eagle Premier and I just show them, okay, Bob, this is going to be the max coverage. I'm obligated to show you the max that you can qualify for. Obviously, Bob, we can find options that are um, that are less if this is not if this doesn't make sense for your budget, okay? Because that's the most important thing. So then I show thirty thousand. I explain to them the program. Okay, so I'll we'll touch on that. Um, I explain to them the program. I explain to them, you know, it comes with a with an accidental writer attached. So if you die of an accident, um, I'll pay double. I make a joke, which I don't, um, I just tell them, so Mary, if something does happen, call me before you call the cops and we'll make it look like an accident. And some people laugh. Some people think it's like, like not funny. And I'm like, oh shoot, shouldn't have said that. But um, I do do that. And then I just show them the option. If it doesn't make sense, then I show them 20,000. And then I, I write down 20,000 and 10,000. And I go, okay, Bob, if you were to qualify, which one of these two options makes the most sense to you financially? And as soon as they pick an option, I just go, okay, perfect, Bob, let me see your driver's license so we can do the application. And once I have the driver's license, I pull up the application and that's where I'm building rapport. I start asking questions like, you know, where the two of you meet, where just things like that. And at the end of it, I start, that's where I sell myself again. I go, Bob, if something happens, Mary's going to be calling me and I'm going to make sure Mary gets taken care of. I'm going to make sure I'll do everything I can in my power to make sure we get her, her money as soon as possible. So you don't have to worry about that. And that's where I think people 
that's that's selling yourself and that's going to that's going to lower the amount of cancellations and things that you get too because your clients are going to remember you they're not going to remember the carrier all life insurance policies have a death benefit they all do the same thing you die it pays out so you need to make sure that you're spending time really just showing them how much you care and how much you're going to be there for their family on their worst day of their life. Excuse me. So, um, all right, that's pretty much it. I wanted to open it up for questions as well to see if you guys have any questions, you can type them in the chat um, or you can unmute. It's totally up to you. Hey, Elaine, I just had like uh, one question for you. Um, how would you go about like at the end if you do it every appointment or maybe just every now and then like ask for referrals? So um, I am was the worst at that, Travis. I was mm -hmm. like, I think the first like year and a half I wrote and I helped clients. I never asked for a referral. And I think about it all the time. Uh, there's so much business I left on the table. Um, so I just, I, there are people, I've seen the people do it a few ways. The way that works for me, I, I'll to give you two options of what I've seen. Um, so one person that's really good at getting referrals, he, he'll ask for like, Hey, can you give me a list of like maybe three to five people of who I would be contacting or so I can contact them and let them know you put this in place. Right. So that way somebody knows that they have, that you put this life insurance in place to protect them. And that's how they create referrals. Um, I was just kind of like, Mary, you know, when I'm talking to them about their kids or whatever, I'm just like, well, do you know if your family has any protection in place? Because, uh, you know, I can help people, your kids, I can help your grandkids. Mm -hmm. And that's honestly, I just asked like that. Got you. Okay. And I have like a second question too. Um, yeah, so like, uh, what do you have in place today that's like a life insurance is there like a typical answer that they'll say like, well, yeah, I got like a barrel policy or what's like another typical answer that you get with that? Um, I do get a lot of people that tell me, yes, they have like a small burial policy or they have like something little through their credit union. Um, mm -hmm. or I get, a, I get people that tell me that I don't have anything there. I don't have nothing. I don't have any life insurance. I don't have any type of retirement. I don't have any savings. And then that's when they tell me that. And I'm just like, okay, yeah, now I know why we need to put this in place. Mm -hmm. Now I see why this is so important now. Okay. And now I'm just having, I'm just, when they tell me that I almost like it better because then I can mm -hmm. say, okay, now I know why we need this. And now I see why this is so important because you guys don't have anything. You're not getting any younger. Gotcha. Okay. Nice. Appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. So for your state that doesn't offer Eagle Premier, um, you could do the AIG, the Simplified Issue Whole Life. That's a really good product. Um, Prosperity New Vista has a really good product as well for their for the whole life. And then hopefully it becomes available soon. Okay, awesome. Well, if there's no more questions, thank you guys for jumping on. You guys have a nice week. <laughs>